Welcome to the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's precious metals news. It's Friday, October 18th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Well, gold spent most of the week under the $1,500 mark, but briefly rose above that level on Thursday on a weak U.S. dollar. The dollar index hit an eight-week low. The greenback is fading due in part to the downbeat U.S. retail sales data that was released on Wednesday. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. News that the EU and the United Kingdom have reached a Brexit deal gave a big boost to the euro and the British pound, and that also weighed on the dollar. It's not a done deal yet, though. The British Parliament has to approve the deal, and it sounds like that could be a dicey prospect. But just as it is with the U.S. trade deal, markets like any kind of positive news. Speaking of the trade war, the U.S. and China have supposedly reached a phase one agreement. This is mostly according to President Trump. The Chinese really haven't confirmed a lot of what the president has said. At a weekly press conference on Thursday, the Chinese trade minister did not confirm when a phase one agreement would be signed or whether the leaders of both countries plan to meet. From what I've read, the actual deal will be written over the next three weeks or so. To steal a phrase from Nancy Pelosi, we'll probably have to wait until it's signed to see what's in it. Regardless, the sense of progress has buoyed markets, and I think that's part of why gold has hovered below that $1,500 mark. Most people seem to think the economy is going to take off once we have this trade war settled, and that's added a little risk sentiment to the markets. I'm skeptical. Peter Schiff talked about this so-called phase one trade deal in one of his podcasts this week, and he made a pretty good point. He reminded us that not too long ago, Trump said there wasn't going to be any kind of interim deal. It was all or nothing. Well, apparently now we're doing interim deals or phase deals or whatever you want to call it. Deals in steps. During a press conference about the trade deal, somebody asked Trump about the Fed. He said, we still need those rate cuts. But why? As Peter said, if we got this great deal, We have the greatest economy ever, and now it's going to be even greater because of this great trade deal. Why more cuts? Now, the reason Trump said we need even more rate cuts is because the rates in Germany are lower than they are here. So Trump wants negative rates because that's what we need to get lower than Germany, right? Of course, we're going to get more rate cuts. That's a big part of the reason stocks have made it pretty decent gain this week. Despite some pretty troubling economic news, bad news means a better chance of rate cuts. The markets like the prospect of lower interest rates more than they are disturbed by actual negative economic data. The biggest economic news of the week was the dismal retail sales report that came out. Now, keep in mind, as I reported earlier this month, the ISM index of national factory activity for September came in under 50 for the second month in a row. This indicates that manufacturing is actually already in recession. The September ISM non-manufacturing index isn't doing a whole lot better. It charted at 52.6, down from August's reading of 56.4. That was the lowest reading in three years. The mainstream pundits warned that this disappointing service sector data could boost recession fears, as this is the largest component of the U.S. economy. And then on Wednesday, we got the retail sales numbers for September, and they were equally bleak. Retail sales fell for the first time in seven months, dropping 0.3%. Analysts had expected sales to increase by 0.3%. Now, that number looks even gloomier when you compare it to September of last year, when retail sales had climbed to 4.1%. Core retail sales, not including autos, gasoline, building materials, and food services, were basically unchanged last month. CNBC reported that the trend in core retail sales hint at a marked slowdown in consumer spending in the third quarter. There are other signs that the U.S. retail economy is cracking. Shopping mall vacancies have hit an eight-year high, according to data from Moody's Analytics. 9.4% of units were unoccupied in Q3. That equals a post-financial crisis high that was reached back in 2011. And the consumer debt report for August raises even more concerns. Overall, Americans continue to pile on debt, according to the latest data released by the Fed. But credit card debt actually fell slightly. This raises a troubling question. 
are consumers close to maxing out the plastic? Total consumer credit grew by another $17.9 billion in August and set yet another record. That represents an annualized increase of 5.2% and pushes total consumer indebtedness to $4.14 trillion. That's seasonally adjusted. The Fed consumer debt numbers include credit card debt, student loans, and auto loans, but it does not factor in mortgage debt. Now, despite the overall rise in consumer debt, revolving credit balances actually fell by $23.3 billion. That's a 2.2% decrease. A sharp increase in non-revolving credit, made up primarily of auto loans, student loans, and financing for other big-ticket purchases, pushed overall consumer indebtedness higher. Borrowers piled on another $238.1 billion in non-revolving credit. That's a 7.8% increase. Now, you can look at the drop in revolving balances in two ways. A falling credit card debt burden would certainly be viewed as a positive by many people. Although, big picture, it's still pretty ugly. Even with that drop, Americans still owe over $1.7 trillion on credit cards. Nevertheless, the drop could mean consumers are starting to pay down balances, they're getting their financial house in order. That would be good news, right? Or it could simply mean that consumers have maxed out the plastic and they simply can't charge anymore. This seems more likely to me. I don't really buy into the mainstream narrative on credit cards. The conventional view is that consumers charge up their credit cards when they are confident about their economic prospects. Now, maybe it's just me, but I've never used credit cards that way. I generally pull out the plastic when I don't have enough money to pay a bill. You know, the car breaks down or maybe the hot water heater springs a leak. Now, when my finances were a bit more, shall we say, tenuous, I used my credit cards to pay for groceries when I was short on cash. That's been my relationship with plastic. I can't ever think of a time when I said, hey, times are good. Let's charge a bunch of stuff up on a credit card. If I have money, I just pay for stuff. Now, I know it's never a good idea to generalize personal experiences to the entire world, but I have a feeling there are a lot of people out there that are like me. And whenever the pundits start talking about how rising credit card debt is a good sign for the economy, I'm just really skeptical about that. Rising credit card debt could just as well mean consumers are tapped out and charging everyday purchases on their plastic. It could say, Americans are struggling to make ends meet. Here's the bottom line, though. Whether driven by confidence or desperation, debt-fueled spending can't go on forever. Credit cards have this inconvenient thing called a limit, and they have to be paid off at some point. At best, quote-unquote confident American consumers are borrowing money from their future. And it looks like the future could be now. The August debt report indicates the spending might be coming to an end. The retail sales report is telling us the same thing. If that's actually what's going on, it is not good news for the U.S. economy. Because you know what? The greatest economy in the history of the world is built on debt. The entire economy is predicated on Americans spending money they don't have. That's the whole reason we have to keep talking about rate cuts. Rate cuts are supposed to stimulate borrowing and spending. Boy, and it sure has worked. I'm using air quotes around worked. Consumer spending increased by 4.3% and contributed nearly all of the GDP growth in Q2. Many of the headlines when that report came out credited the American consumer with, quote, rescuing the economy. But as Peter asked at the time, if the consumer rescued the economy, who the hell is going to rescue the consumer? Because if you look at where the consumer is getting the money, it's from credit. It's all debt. Year over year, consumer debt has increased by over 5%. So what is driving consumer spending? is debt. If Americans are getting close to maxing out those credit cards, that does not bode well for the future of economic growth. And if that moment isn't on us yet, it will be at some point in the not-too-distant future. While we're on the subject of debt, the IMF issued another warning on corporate debt. Now, the IMF has expressed concern about rising corporate debt levels before, and the latest report said easy money policies by central banks around the world have exacerbated the situation, leading to worrisome levels of debt with poor credit quality and increasing financial vulnerabilities over the medium term. That's the word they're using, worrisome. According to the IMF, 40% of all corporate debt in major economies could be considered, quote, at risk in another global downturn, exceeding levels seen during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. That seems less than ideal. 
And to complete the debt trifecta, we have the ever-growing national debt. I talked about that last week. If you missed it, the CBO came out with the FY 2019 budget deficit estimate. It came out just a hair under $1 trillion. That may seem like good news. It's under a trillion. Woo! That just goes to show how low the bar has sunk. It will still end up being the biggest deficit since 2012. Keep in mind, we've only been over $1 trillion deficits four times, all during the Great Recession. We're right at that level now. We're seeing recession-level deficits during the greatest economy in the history of the world. Again, that seems less than ideal. And with that, I'm about out of time. So, for more information about how precious metals can help shield your wealth from less than ideal, Call 1-888-GOLD-160 today. Talk to a Shift Gold Precious Metal Specialist. They can give you all the lowdown on what's going on with the economy and how investing in gold and silver can help your portfolio. Well, that is a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more and keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week at shiftgold.com slash news. If you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to this podcast over at iTunes or at the Shift Gold YouTube channel. You'll find links for that on the show notes page. And if you're listening on YouTube, as always, we're happy to hear your comments and input about what is going on in the economy. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you again next week.